Now you're cooking. Hey guys. Hello, gorgeous. You took this car out, didn't you? I sure did. The Ertl Diecast 116th scale Coyote from Hardcastle and McCormick was released in 1983. Well, she must be about 30 years old now. It's a long time ago, Judge. Oh, it sure is. A little more than that, but just like the real thing, this piece is just as gorgeous as ever, despite a few scrapes. The 80s were famous for having TV shows with vehicles that were considered just as much of a star of their shows as the actual actors, such as Kit from Knight Rider, the General Lee from Dukes of Hazzard, BA's Van on the A-Team, and the lady herself, Airwolf. But after finishing season one of Hardcastle and McCormick, I can now say my favorite 80s TV show vehicle is the Cody Coyote X. It wasn't just a cool, fast car. Kit and the General Lee were regular street vehicles, a Pontiac Trans Am and a Dodge Charger. Sure, they had cool customizations, but in the end, they weren't too different from what you'd see every now and then on roads in your own town. The Coyote, however, looked like a really expensive, professional race car. Excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry, I have to go. I have to go, sorry. It was totally out of place on city roads, which gave it all its charm. Oh no, no, come on little kids. Come on little boy, come on, you gotta get out of there. You can't be in there. Was it even road legal? It was like driving a Formula One car around town. I mean, I can't be very inconspicuous driving around in a bright red firecracker, you know? The windshield made it look more like a cockpit of a jet than a car. The plastic for this windshield is clear with a bit of a tint to it, like the back window and headlights. The front looks sleek as well as ferocious like a pair of fangs on a cobra, or a rabid coyote. The decals aren't over the top, just some simple stickers along the bottom of the side saying coyote with the little running coyote logo. Even the name is perfect, coyote. They didn't have to overcompensate and use a name like puma, cheetah, or leopard. They used a more common animal that's a ferocious little bugger, downplaying just how rare, exotic, and awesome this car is. It's so common for TV and movie producers to try to build and build upon something. So I appreciate that Cannell and his crew made this amazing car and then said, let's just call it the Coyote. I mean, look at it. It doesn't need a fancy name, elaborate paint job, or big fancy decal on the hood. It doesn't need anything, it's gorgeous. Speaking of a decal on the hood, this sticker on the front isn't show accurate, and I don't think it adds to the look of the toy. But I've decided to keep it on since it's part of the original piece, and because I may not be able to remove it without damaging the nice shiny cherry red paint job underneath. Nice tires on this piece as well. Ertl brand! They went the extra mile and chromed the hubcaps. The tires are hard plastic. Not so good for jumps. But on the plus side, no splitting, as many rubber tires on toy cars do over time. Only the top of the car is die cast. The underneath is plastic like the interior. The wheels are joined by a rod underneath. It's held together with rivets, not screws, so you won't be able to easily take it apart to customize it. The interior of the Coyote in the pilot episode was tan. I love a parade. <laughs> but in later episodes, changed to black, like this toy version, which I think looks better. Nice detailing on the seats, and two integral pieces for any toy car, the stick shift and steering wheel. Oh, she does ride nice, Rabbit. Some speed gauge detailing is a nice touch too. How fast can that bullet go? They included holes for the legs of action figures to fit through so you can place three and three quarter inch figures inside. Another nice touch since I've seen a lot of toy and model cars this size which don't do this and so figures won't fit. You have to either cut a hole yourself, which can be very difficult with so little room to work with, or remove the figure's legs. It's also nice that they made the headlights a separate piece of clear smoked plastic instead of just painting the details on. The downside to this is the headlights often break and go missing. Like the General Lee, you had to get into the Coyote through the window, although this car had a little more room to get in than the General. Put your fanny right there and slide your feet down through the window. 
This added a dynamic to the show, just like on Dukes, where Mark and sometimes the judge would literally jump into the car instead of opening a door, getting in, closing, and taking off. <laughs> Here's a bit of trivia though, the season 1 coyote did in fact have working doors. Sort of. There's this very quick shot from the fourth episode titled Going Nowhere Fast, where we see the judge close what looks like a half door. Probably an editing error. One other thing I wish they'd borrowed from the General Lee was the horn. The coyote did not have a fierce howl. The car did make a great sound as it was driving by though. A deep, ferocious roar that reminds me of Airwolf's ominous, whispering howl as it flies. This die-cast car is a pretty faithful reproduction of the coyote used in the first season of Hardcastle and McCormick. Well, what do you think? I think you designed one hell of a car, that's what I think. The full-size Coyote was a kit car that used the chassis of a Volkswagen Beetle with a Porsche 914 engine. The body was based on the McLaren M6 GT. No, Bose, you got it wrong. Okay, it's actually a modified Manta Montage, which is a kit car replica of the McLaren M6 GT. I picked this particular Coyote up on eBay after a long wait. Do you have any idea how many guys are looking for this car? Oh, I bet a lot. They don't show up too often, and when they do, they're either mint in box, which is way out of my price range, or they're too beat up from taking too many jumps. Most of the ones I've seen have either one or two missing headlights, and lots of paint chipping. I was lucky to find this one for not too much. The original front and side stickers are still intact and in pretty good shape. Unfortunately, the back sticker, which featured the taillights, has fallen off, leaving only a 30 plus year sticky residue, but some goo gone was able to remove that. The paint job on this one is still nice and shiny, with a few paint chips, but I think it actually adds to the look of the car. Unlike Kit, which was an invincible supercar, the Coyote could take damage. You guys don't need car insurance, you need life insurance. Its strength was its incredible speed and maneuverability, and so to avoid the Superman complex of being too powerful like Kit, its weakness is that it can get shot up and damaged from big jumps, raising the stakes on the show. The tires were also prone to flats when exposed to hot lead. I think we got a flat tire. As fun as the show was, they had to deal with more real world problems than Kit did, like constantly having their car insurance revoked because of all the damage the coyote would sustain. That's 14 bullet holes in the last two months. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cancel your insurance. Someday I might try my hand at a replacement sticker for the back and painting the paint chips. Bad idea, McCormick. True, Judge. There's something to be said for sometimes leaving things in their original condition. One of the things I loved about the Coyote is that it blew every other car on the show out of the water. I like that it wasn't a sci-fi supercar with a jet turbo boost. It just had a powerful engine, great aerodynamics, and a world-class driver behind the wheel. Unlike on other shows when the bad guys took off, on Hardcastle and McCormick, you know they'll never get away from the Coyote. The fun is in watching how McCormick gains on them. They're gaining. Now we're gaining on them. And ultimately makes them crash. Seriously, the Coyote has this amazing ability to cause most cars it's chasing to crash. Even if McCormick doesn't do anything elaborate to cause the crash. Sometimes he'd just repeatedly glance at you. It's a Stephen J. Cannell show though, so people will usually be able to climb out of the wreckage and dust themselves off, no matter how horrifically their car gets mangled. The bad guys never got away, but sometimes they could slow the coyote down with a lead injection. See if you can slow him down, will you? He's got a gun, watch it. Mark was good at dodging bullets, though. When you call me Mark, I get nervous. Sorry. And the same goes for whenever the bad guys are tailing the coyote. Are we being solid? Yeah, it looks like it. 
This is great. It's a foregone conclusion the coyote is going to get away, especially if it's being tailed by a piece of crap. The fun is in watching Hardcastle and McCormick toying with whoever is following them, and could even make followers crash. Even when they were being boxed in by semis and about to be crushed, they still stayed pretty cool because, hey, they're in the freaking coyote! And with the car's low build, it was able to do things normal show cars couldn't, like drive under trailers, either parked or in motion. What are you nuts? Even though it looked like a pro racetrack car, the Coyote handled great off-road as well. You wouldn't think a car that low could handle that well off-road, but the huge tires gave it a lot more maneuverability than most other race cars. And it was great for long distance travel too. McCormick once drove it all the way from California to New York, thanks to some bad green screening. What's that supposed to mean? I just mean it was a bit ridiculous driving a supercharged racing car across an entire country as if it was a station wagon. You're crazy, you know that? Yeah, but I'm so fast. I'm so fast. <laughs> but that was another part of what I liked about McCormick and his car. He didn't baby it. He drove the shit out of it. Probably because he got it for free. What's this? I want you to have it. While this model replica looks great, I think it's missing two major pieces. Hardcastle and McCormick. 80s shows had some cool vehicles, but they weren't the stars of the show. They were co-stars. It was an ensemble cast. The General Lee is armyless without them Duke boys. Goo -goo -goo. Kit's lights are out without Michael Knight behind the wheel. Airwolf is fangless without Stringfellow Hawk and Dominic Santini in the cockpit. And the Coyote won't drive without Judge Milton C. Hardcastle and Mark Skid McCormick. This particular version of the Coyote came in two versions one without a figure, and one with. I still can't believe there's an actual, official Mark McCormick action figure out there. I'll probably never own one though, so I decided to do a little customizing to fill the Coyote's seats. Being 1 16th scale, this car fits G.I. Joe sized figures, so I used a 25th anniversary G.I. Joe Matt Tracker figure's body, along with a head of a Star Wars A-Wing Green Leader pilot figure named Arvel Crinned. Crin. Crinid. Crinid. Or something like that. There aren't many figures this size with curly brown hair, but I think this bears a close enough resemblance. He's smart, he's clever, he's resourceful, he's good looking, right? He's a genius. Milt and Mark don't have a regular outfit they wear every episode, so the costumes are a personal preference. I decided to go with the racing outfit that the tracker figure had because it's close to the one Skid wore on the show a couple of times, and the red accents go nicely with the coyote. For the judge figure, I used a custom white-haired head from Marauder Gunrunners, as well as one of their black baseball caps, and the body of Bandai's Dragon Ball Evolution Master Roshi, aka Chow Yun Fat, because I wanted to give him the Hawaiian shirt look from the pilot episode. That's brilliant. That is pretty smart, isn't it? I decided to pass on the short shorts though, even though the judge had a great set of gams. That's the first thing he said all day I agree with. And of course, the slow motion man needs iron and steel in the palm of his hand. Or rather, under his armpit. So I gave him the underarm holster from the G.I. Joe Chuckles figure from the 50th anniversary Desert Duel set. Nice one. It takes a little longer to put the figures in the car than it took the Judge and McCormick to hop into their ride. Some finagling is required if you're using modern style G.I. Joe figures like this one, and it can be a bit tricky to get him to hold both the steering wheel and the shifter. But luckily they made the steering wheel adjustable. It pivots up or down a bit, which gives you just a little more range with a figure that doesn't have much articulation. With this particular figure, his arms still aren't quite long enough, so I have to sit him like this, slightly leaning forward and twisted, back a bit away from the seat. I like that the head is almost touching the roof, though. Just like McCormick on the show, since he was a bit too tall for the coyote. Yeah, show me some of that hot shot driving girl he's talking about. Just hold on, I can't. <laughs> Okay.
The idea of owning an actual life-size replica of a coyote may seem like a dream come true for Hardcastle and McCormick fans, but I'm perfectly satisfied with this much cheaper miniature alternative. Because this is how we imagine we'd get into our own custom coyote and take off. But for most of us, I think this would be the reality. If you're interested in having your own Ertl diecast coyote, eBay and vintage toy shows are your only option. What for? I don't have any money. Then you can watch this video again. That's a big part of why I love doing these videos. Getting to share some rare pieces from my collection with you in glorious high def. And the coyote is most definitely art to me and a piece of TV history. Leave a coyote comment below, share if you like the video, and to join the tribe, hit subscribe.